around why we are Christians. My name is Kent Philpott, and today we're going to be talking with Stephen Campbell. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for having I've been, me. I've been talking, I've been calling you Steve. Steve is the name. Yes. Steve is good? Yeah, okay, with you're Steve. Steve. Yes. yes. And uh, where do you live, first of all? Lorona Park. Okay, Lorona Park. You're just so up, very close, yes. You're just up Highway 101 yeah. from yeah. here. Moved there in 86, raised my family there. So Really? My family, yeah. Okay, all yeah. right. Um, where were you born? Born in Helena, Montana. Came, uh, Helena? Helena, Montana. Right. Came to California when I was three. Lived in San Diego, went to San Diego State, and uh, then moved up here in 83 to Northern California. To Northern California yes, in 83. Yes. Well, how did you get up here to? Well, I it was a materials manager, and I got a job in Stockton. So I moved my family up to Stockton and stayed there for a couple of years, and then I got a job at Marin General Hospital, and I was commuting from Stockton to Marin, two hours one way. Ooh. Yeah. Oh. So um, we moved to Ronert Park so that the commute would not be as bad. Okay. So there you go. I've yeah. had three of my kids born at Marin General Hospital. Yeah. Beautiful hospital. Oh, Huge. I love Marin General. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. yeah. Fabulous Wonderful hospital. Wonderful place to be. So, yes. uh, and I know on your book, which we'll get to your book later, mm -hmm. but it says Stephen Campbell, M-S-I-S. That's Masters of Science of Information Systems. That's okay. basically computers. Okay. And people ask me, what did you learn when you got your master's? And my answer is, I learned how little I know. <laughs> because the world <laughs> yeah. of computers is like the world of the brain and physiology. They just learn things almost every week. Then if you don't keep up, it's, it's old hat. Right. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with the computer world. All right. Yeah. So. So uh, how'd you meet your wife? I met my wife when I was working with Campus Crusade for Christ. You uh, was you work with Campus Crusade for Christ. I worked the Campus for Crusade for Christ. So I you knew Bill Bright. Oh yes, yes, I was there, and uh, I uh, became a member of a group called the New Folk, and I became the spokesman for the New Folk. Now, what are the New Folk? The New Folk is a group of seven singers who okay. traveled I, around. I've heard them. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Traveled around America for two years, and it was on that tour that I met my wife. Okay. And there you go. And now, I have to ask you, did you yes. know Jack Sparks or Pat Matriciana of Campus Crusade? I don't remember. I don't okay. remember. This was... I remember Jack Sparks, but I don't remember Patriciana. No. Oh, Matriciana. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, they were part of Christian World Liberation Front, which was... Uh, initiated by Campus Crusade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember that vaguely. Yeah. That was a long time ago. Long time so, ago. Yes. Um, a lot of the people are still doing it. Mm -hmm. Still doing it. That's Steve. right. Yeah. Their 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 headquarters is now in Florida, I think. Oh, is that it? Yeah, but in they're Florida. but they're. I didn't know. Yeah, they're still doing really really well. Used to be Arrowhead Springs. Arrowhead Springs. That's where I met. I, I met Bill Bright at Arrowhead Springs yeah, many yeah. years ago. I did too, and I have heard him many many times. And yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Amazing guy. So you go way back. Your credentials in evangelical Christianity are long are time. Pretty yeah. solid and long. It's interesting term. how I became a Christian. My father had been looking for the Lord for a long time. Your father. And my father and was we, look was looking for the Lord, and we had gone to church, and he just felt there was something wrong. He was an anesthesiologist, and one time just before a surgery, the surgeon who was going to work up with the patient knew that the patient was a Christian. So he said, would you like to pray to the Christian and to the patient? The patient said yes, so he prayed. And my father sensed a personal prayer that he had not heard and that he wanted. So after the patient recovered, my dad went to him and said, would you come to our house and tell us about God? So really? one night, one night at the dinner table, my dad announced at 7 o'clock, I'll be in the living room because we're going to have some people talk to us about God. And sure enough, at 7 o'clock, Jack and Dorothy Kendall showed up at the house, and Jack took the parents into the living room, and Dorothy took the kids along with me. I had five siblings into the other room and shared the gospel with us. And over the next three months, we all became Christians. Really? Yeah. And how old were yeah. you at this I point? I was 10. I was you were 10, 10. 10 years old when I asked Christ. 10 years Christ old. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, were you baptized? I was baptized uh, when I was in college. In college. In so there college. was a distance. There was a distance there because yeah. I wasn't, I didn't really understand what baptism was all about. Right. But when I got to college, I did. So I said, okay, I need to be baptized. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. At 10, 
uh, you're not likely you're to not get really it. You're not really sure. Yeah. 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 You wouldn't want to do it just to do it because yeah. that was expected there was, of There you. was no meaning to it. But, yes. But, okay. but in college, you understood what Christ did for you. So yeah. you got baptized. Yeah. Um, Where'd you go to college? I went to college at San Diego State University. San Diego and State. I got, got my undergraduate degree in zoology. And then um, it's an interesting story how I really met Mary. I was working with Camp Crusade for Christ as a, as a student. And one night I was driving a crusade staff member back to where we lived. San Diego State is up on a mesa. And a young man who was on drugs ran into our car in an attempt to kill himself. And what? To, in an attempt to kill himself. He was on drugs. And he oh ran my. into our car with his, he ran, I was driving a VW bug and he was driving an old 88. And the a lot crusade, of difference. Oh, yeah. And the crusade member that I was driving home was killed instantly. And uh, my body was crushed for about a year. Um, but as a result of that accident, I met Mary. Okay. So is one year in a hospital with 46 years with Mary? Not even a question. <laughs> so I thank the Lord every day for that accident. Yeah. yeah. How many, did you have kids? We have uh, two daughters, Abigail and Sarah. Abigail lives in San Francisco and Sarah lives in Petaluma about 15 months away. Really? And, and we have two grandchildren now and they're adorable. And I've got 30,000 copies of uh, pictures of my grandchildren if you'd like to see them or if you'd like to see them, I'll show them. <laughs> well, I want you to send me some. <laughs> so the people right now will be looking at those I will photographs. Show them. And they're both, me, and both of our daughters are redheads, would you believe? They're redheads. Yes, who yeah. know where that came from, but they're both bright red hair and Mary's not a redhead and I'm not either but someplace somehow the someplace in the jeans yes right and and actually Abby's son is a redhead too bright really? red hair yeah recessive gene recessive gene I am take it you retired from Marin General actually I retired I worked at a number of hospitals Marin Healdsburg Alta Bates I was the materials manager I was the guy that bought everything to make sure that everyone had everything to run the hospital and uh, uh, the last hospital I worked at was Healdsburg Hospital. And then I decided I want to go back and get my master's. So I went back to school, went to USF, and spent two years getting my master's, and then became a professor and began teaching computer courses. You got another degree. Oh, well, this my, is the master's yeah, MSIS. This is, this is the MSIS. I got that when I was 55. 65? 55. 55. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was older. Yes. Okay. And then I began teaching, and I began teaching computer courses. Where, did, where were you teaching at? I was teaching at USF. I was teaching at the JC, Santa Rosa JC. I was teaching, actually, I taught at SSU for San, Sonoma State for a while. Sonoma so State. I was sort of taught all over the place. And it's interesting, I was teaching at one college called Empire College in Santa Rosa. And they had me teaching a course called Career Transitions, which is a course for beginning students. And because I've been studying the brain for so many years on my own, because I find it fascinating, I took what I know about the brain and put it into that class. And the president noticed that when students took my class at the beginning of the program, they wouldn't drop out. And like the retention went up from 63 to 93% when they took my class. So he made this directive, everyone's got to take Mr. Kemble's career transitions course. And during the course, during the years that I taught that course, there were the retention was amazing. However, I was not only teaching the course, I was also uh, the evening dean. So I was gone from about 7 in the morning until 10 at night. Wow. And my, my, my wife back in 2008 said, okay, honey, you're 61 years old, your dad died at 62, and you're working 14 hours a day. If you die early, I'll kill you. <laughs> I said, okay, so I retired because I didn't want my wife angry at me for dying. But this information that I had developed was so powerful that I went down to the nearest senior center in Santa Rosa, I sat down with the director. I said, you know what? I've been teaching this to college students about the brain, and I'll share with you what the message is in a second. What would you think if I taught it to some of your seniors? And she said, well, let's give it a try. I would do an eight hour course. And uh, let's just do the first three on a Tuesday. So I did the first three, and by the third week, the people in the course went down to the director, and they cornered her in her office. And they said, you can't let him finish next, this week. You have to make him do all, all eight. 
And so she came back to me, would you? Absolutely. And then all the other senior centers in Sonoma County, Cloverdale, Guerneville, et cetera, called and they said, can't you do it here? And I said, absolutely. So I did. And uh, then there's this place called the Verena, which is up in the hills of Santa Rosa on Fountain Grove. It is where the millionaires retire. They have their own cobblestone streets, their own lake, their own golf course, their own everything. It's just beautiful. What's it called again, Steve? Uh, the Verena, V-A-R-E-N-N-A. -N -N -A. And uh, they called and they said, would you like to come up and see our facilities? And I said, sure. So I did, and they said, would you like to do your presentation here? And I said, I'd love to. And then they said, what's your fee? My what? Yeah, what do you charge? Well, I've never charged before. Well, don't you, shouldn't you charge for this? Oh, okay. So I gave them a cost, and they said, sure, we'll pay that. Because wow. you were used to doing it for free. I was free. used to doing it for free. <laughs> and then people began saying, where's your book, where's your book, where's your book? What book? Don't you have a book? Well, I've written two college textbooks on computer software. No, 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 no. You have to write a book about this. And you have to write a book about the brain and what you've been teaching us because we want to take it home and read it. And you have to make it really easy. So I wrote the book called Making Your Mind Magnificent. And I got a uh, presentation for a group called TOPS, Taking Off Pounds Sensibly. And they're for older people who want to lose weight. And they're a convention. And they called me, they said, we'd like for you to come and do a breakout session, which is in a small room and stuff like that. So I said, sure. So I wrote the book, the book arrived, and Mary and I piled some books in a car and drove to San Ramon on a Saturday morning, walked in, sat down, where do you want me to, where do you want me to do the breakout session? And they said, we changed our mind, we want you to be the keynote speaker. And you're gonna speak in front of 600 people. So I began speaking and people began leaving the room while I was speaking. They were leaving the room to buy a book. <laughs> and when I was done, we had sold, we were selling thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of books. And we were driving over to the cheese factory in San Ramon with Mary counting $20 bills. And I was talking to the Lord and I was saying, this thing could be really huge. Why me? And I almost think, Kent, I didn't hear him, but I sensed that still small voice saying, why not you? Now you're working for me. And that's how the whole thing started. That's how, okay. Yeah, and that was back in 2008. So that was almost nine years ago. Okay. So now, since then, I've been speaking to, I think around, well, I, I did a calculation. I've spoken so far to about 30,000 people. Wow. In audiences all over America about yeah. the information that I have developed. And we want to get, we want to get to that. We want to get to a lot of that material. Yeah. Um, as I looked over the table of contents, I, I saw how well I identified with mm -hmm. uh, what what you were talking about. But let's let's go a couple of different places. Okay. Would Would you share with us maybe some of the struggles that you've personally gone through, Steve? Well, let me tell you what really happened when I was at Empire College. I used to be very affectionate, and I would hug people, and you can't do that in a college situation and so the president called me to his office one time and he said did you hug so and so and I said I probably did and he said well uh, you can't do that and they let me go and I was gonna have to tell Mary that I just thought got, like, just got let go for that and uh, so I was home early on a Friday she came home from work came upstairs sat across she said what happened I told her and she said to me God's going to do something wonderful here. And if that hadn't happened, none of this would have happened. Yeah. So well, that would have been a shock. It was a shock. People would think, now how long ago did this happen? That was 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Well, yeah. Still at a period where people were very sensitive. Oh, very. Yes. And the accusations would yeah. fly, sexual yeah. harassment, yeah. inappropriate behavior. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah, and none of it was, but it was just enough to let me get going. It's a shattering experience. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. And I was 62. That was the beginning of the, the Great Recession in 2008. Yes, it was. So, so that was a hard, hard time. And I said, Lord, I don't understand. And the Lord brought me a book of Joseph 
where Joseph said to his brothers after he had been captured and was in Egypt, he said, you meant it for bad, but God meant it for good. And okay. God used that. And if there's anything that I've learned in my 50 years of walking and stumbling with the Lord, and in fact, it's the one of the themes of my book, is that God uses everything yes. in our life to bring us closer to Him. I am no longer qualified. Yes. I am no longer able. In yes. our, I was part of the Jesus People movement. Yes. Uh, and so many of the people who were converted in that time went through struggles. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, I would find some of these people would go through a decade, two decades, sometimes three decades of being apart yeah. because of some problem. Yeah. A divorce, yeah. struggle with drugs, struggle yeah. with alcohol, yeah. Yeah. Um, mental illness, yeah. a lot of mental illness, yeah. depressions, bipolar, yeah. all kinds yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And they would think, I can't serve the Lord. Yeah. I'm no good. Yeah. Yeah. Only to find yeah. out later, go, wait a minute, I'm still here. I'm still following Jesus. That's right. There's a wonderful story in Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah sees God as he really is. And his reaction is, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. Woe is me. And what God says is, I'm going to bring an angel who will touch your lips, touch your lips, and you will be clean. And then, this is the part I love, God then says, who wants to go? And Isaiah says, here am I, Hineni. send me. In Hebrew, Hineni. I know. Here I, here he, I am, here send I am. me. Send me. And I love that. It's just because God is always working with us. And a lot of it is really, really hard. As you look at the characters of the Bible, you see so many mistakes. You see Adam and the fall. You see Moses and his temper who kept him out of Isaac. You see Abraham selling off his wife twice and Isaac doing the same thing. Of course, you see David and Bathsheba. Um, David and um, yeah, Bathsheba. Bathsheba. And you see, you see all these characters. Um, in fact, at the end of Paul's life in 1 Timothy 1, he talked to himself as the chief of sinners. Mm -hmm. The chief, of, and here's a person who wrote a third of the New Testament. Yeah. And so what that says to me is that, yes, when you become a Christian, you're going to enter a battle. It's a battle with the world, but more than that, it's a battle with yourself. Because now you have this new mind, this new heart, but you still have this flesh which got the sin. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't go away until you go to glory. That's right. Yeah, the flesh is not evil. No. But it is, it is a kind of a metaphor for the fact that we have certain drives in us. We, because of our human condition and, and living in a fallen world. Yes. Living in the fallen world is yes. a big deal. Oh, yes. And particularly yeah. when, when the culture is moving farther and farther away mm -hmm. from biblical principles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for Christians because when you sin as a non-Christian, it's no big deal. When you sin as a Christian, it bothers you. And the longer you walk with the Lord, the more your sin bothers you, the more it drives you crazy. And it's hard. Oh, it's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. 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 When, uh, whenever I have an opportunity to speak with somebody who has been walking with the Lord as long as you have, and I, I became a Christian in 1963. Okay, I was, I was, let's see, when did I become a Christian? 10, so I was 47, 50, I would become a Christian when I was in 57. 67, 50, okay. 57, Six, yeah. 57? 57. 57. 57. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was 21 years old. Okay, I was 10. No, yeah, and when I became a Christian, and um, we have no idea. No. We have no idea no, what, what this... we don't have a clue. We don't have... We yeah. have no idea that how huge... Yeah. How huge this is. Yeah. What it may, in fact, I say in the first sentence of my book, which we'll talk about in a while, more changes take place when you become a Christian than when you go to heaven. <laughs> yeah. When you go to heaven, your body's replaced, but all the other stuff, you've been reconciled to God, there's no condemnation, you're in Christ, you've been given the mind, the mind of Christ. All those places, those things took place now. They've already taken place. It takes a lifetime to bring them out and to be conformed to Christ, but they've already happened. 
You know, I would like to refer to it as growing up into the stature of the fullness of Christ, mm -hmm. lifelong process, mm -hmm. and there are um, adventures. Yes, yes. Oh, along the way, so and adventures. And mistakes and adventures, and yet God is with you the whole time. I love Philippians 3, where Paul says, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward what lies ahead. There's a principle in psychology called uh, the strongest picture. What we now know about the brain is the brain locks on to the strongest picture. Let me give an example. When I was a little boy, my dad taught me how to ride a bicycle. Say that again. I'll give you an example. When I was a little boy, my dad taught me how to ride a bicycle. Took me out to this road, took the train, he was off. He said, now before I give you a little shove, you see that rock out there about 50 feet? Yes, Daddy. Don't run into that rock. So I got down on the bike, I was locked onto the rock so I would not run into it. What happened? You ran into it. Bam. That's the way <laughs> the brain works. Incidentally, that's the reason that worrying is simply nothing but negative goal setting. Yeah. That's all it really is. You lock on to what you want. And so what the Christian can do, and the non-Christian doesn't have this option, what the Christian can do is lock on to Christ. And it's a continual, continual, continual thing. I don't mean to promote my new book that I'm finishing up I'm tomorrow. I'm so excited. I can't wait to the read rough, it. The Rough. It's just one of the little books. It's called Biblical Christianity is Healthy. Mm -hmm. And I do talk about our dealing with worry and anxiety. Yeah. And that being in Christ is very healthy for us. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. healthy. Mm -hmm. um, I actually find we get to enjoy our living. Oh, yeah. Enjoy our living despite everything that goes on mm -hmm. and goes wrong. And our bodies betray us. Mm -hmm. And get old. And we get old. Yeah. Yeah. And all that stuff. But yet, uh, there it is. It's, you know, there's physical. I like to talk about it. we got physical and emotional health. Mm -hmm. But the spiritual health. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. is probably the most important because you may lose your physical health. Mm -hmm. You may even lose some of your emotional health, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but that spiritual health, that, yeah. that being yeah. uh, a son or daughter of God mm -hmm. is, it just makes, makes all the difference. Yeah. And I know a lot of this, we, we, we don't want to get too much more into that. No. Um, so, uh, Steve, I have a question for you, though. Okay. Uh, you never went into the ministry. No, no. I was going to. I graduate, we, I s traveled around America for two years as a speaker, and then I was going to go to Berkeley. We even moved to Berkeley to work with Campus of State for Christ, but the Lord just called us out of that, and we decided no. Now, what no. was that that you... This was 1972. Okay, well, that, okay, now, that's when Jack Sparks and Pat Matriciana were in Berkeley with Campus Crusade doing... Christian World Liberation Front. I was there. I was there. I, I was thought there. you had to be. I was there. It was. It was. A, it was a one week where you just the whole, all the campus crusade went to went to Berkeley. I, I was a part of that. Okay. Yeah. Did yeah. you ever meet Holy Hubert? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I, I think I, I'd heard him because the voice, the name strikes something. But yeah. I think I, I don't think I saw him, but I think I'd heard of him. Okay. All yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you, you had a. You could have gone into the We profession. could have, but we said, we, Mary and I said, no, I just don't think this is where we're to go. So we moved from Berkeley to San Diego, and I got a job as a materials manager in a hospital. Okay. And, that's, and I did that for the next 20 years. Yeah. So you, you kept up your, your learning. Uh, you were, were you starting to write was, at that point? I was doing Bible studies. No, I didn't start writing until uh, the late 90s. And my first okay. book was on computers. Okay. College textbooks on computers. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, yeah, that was when I learned I could write. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, this is really interesting. This is a really interesting story. Um, I wrote the book. They loved the book. It was for Q Education, which is the largest computer publishing company in the world. And then as soon as I wrote the book, Q was purchased by Pearson, and they never marketed the book. And so I never made any money from it at all. However, 10 years later, our daughter decided she wanted to go to USF, University of San Francisco. And um, 
uh, I had found out that USF was right in Santa Rosa, in our own backyard. So I applied for a job and uh, didn't get it, but I had brought my book with me, the two books, com uh, the two computer books I had signed. And uh, they said, you can't work here because you don't have a master's, you don't have a doctorate. I said, okay, fine, thank you much. They called me six months later. They said, remember me? We're from USF. A computer class came up, and you're the first person we thought of. I said, well, I can't, I can't work because I don't have a master's. He said, yes, but you're a published author. I said, well, nobody bought the book. And they said, we don't care. So here's what we'll do. Because you're a published author, we'll grandfather you in. And while you're teaching for us, we'll credit you a unit for every unit that you teach. So you can get your own master's while you're working for us as a teacher. And then I said, if Sarah comes, can we do the same thing for her? And they said, absolutely. And I taught there for 10 years at USF all over the Bay Area in Sacramento. And it turns out that it paid for my master's and paid for my, do my daughter's education. Wow. There you go. Isn't that fabulous? In fact, I, I used Excel to put in how much money they paid me per hour times 10, hour, 10 years of teaching plus the tuition I did not have to pay. I had made about $145,000 in a book that never sold. <laughs> That's the Lord. <laughs> That's the Lord. Oh, yeah. gee. That, uh, uh, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. So then um, you, your focus turned from the, the computer to uh, psychology. Focus. Yeah. To something else. My focus turned from computers to psychology and helping students learn how to study helping students learn how to read because the students that we got at this college were really, had come out of a really, really hard situation. They didn't, many of them didn't know how to read, many of them didn't know how to do math. So I developed a class to help them understand how their brain worked. And the message that I gave them is this, our brain believes what we tell it. So when you say, I just cannot do this, the brain says, okay, you're right, you can't, and make sure you can't. But when you say, I can do this, the brain says, absolutely, and then looks for ways of doing it. And so as I taught that to students, they realized that their success is really predicated on what they're saying to themselves about themselves. When, wow. When they did badly on a test and they'd say, oh, I'm so stupid, the brain said, yeah, you are, because that's what they were saying. But when they said, you know what? I learned from this, next time I'll do it that way, the brain says, absolutely. And they began thinking differently. And during- this, And Steve, this is what we're gonna get into a lot more in the, next, in the next program. All right, you've been watching Why We Are Christians. This is part one, our conversation with uh, Steve Campbell. Uh, we're going to uh, be doing a second program. So long.